Hi, I'm Liam, as, as you said. Um, we're going to be talking now about from monolith to microservices, and essentially we're going to be looking at some of the best practices and tips on how to split a monolith into microservices. Um, yeah, and thank you all for being here. Cool, so yeah, so I'm Liam, hello. <laughs> you can see me on Twitter at Liam J. Norman. I sometimes blog at liamnorman.com. Um, I'm a software engineer at superbolist.com, and I'm an organizer of Cape Town PHP. So hopefully one of these describes something about you, and that's hopefully why you're here. You either don't know what microservices are, you have a monolith that you want to migrate, or you're looking to migrate, you're in the process of migrating a monolith, or you're building a new architecture with microservices. If any of that describes you, then this talk is a little bit for all of you. So first off, the definition. What are microservices? Microservices at their core are small, independent, autonomous services that work together. It is very important when you're defining microservices that they should be small. They should accomplish a specific functionality, otherwise you run the risk where you write a microservice, you add more and more to it, and eventually you end up with a monolith once again. You should also make sure that they're independent, and we're gonna look at that soon as to why that is, but microservices should be isolated. So the next thing is that microservices should be autonomous. They should be separate entities. And the reason for this is that we want to avoid something called tight coupling. So tight coupling is when services rely on one another. And basically what you end up is, let's say you have an order service and a product service, but then they're very tightly coupled. They have too much communication between each other. And if one of those fails, you end up in a situation where now the other fails and then it starts to all go not great. Um, you also want to avoid then tight coupling. We want to make sure that that is really important. You don't do it. And then microservices, in terms of how they should communicate, they should communicate with one another via network calls. So if you're wondering, is my microservice autonomous, the golden rule is, can you make a change to your microservice and deploy it by itself without changing anything else? If the answer is no, then your microservice is definitely not autonomous and it's not isolated. So we know a little bit about what microservices are, but what are actually the benefits of them? Why would you want to do them in the first place? The first thing is technology freedom. When you think of a monolith, you end up writing this big application. Maybe it didn't intend to start out that way, but it grows to that size, and you end up using one tech stack. Maybe it's PHP, Java, whatever the case is. With microservices, because we end up with multiple, you can select the right tool for the job. And this is really cool, because then we avoid that one size fits all approach as we often use for a monolith. Um, and this is great also because we get improved performance with the correct tool. Maybe you have a service which needs to do a lot of, um, a lot of processes or it's, up, it's processing a lot of data. Maybe, say, PHP might not be the greatest fit for that, and then you can write it in Java or Golang, or whatever the right idea is. Another benefit is resilience. So in resilience engineering, there is the concept of the bulkhead. And basically what that means is if, your bulk, if something fails in your system and the bulkhead remains intact, it doesn't affect other parts of your system. If the bulkhead fails, however, you end up with cascading failures. And that's another reason why your microservices, at least a tip from, from my side, is to make sure they're not tightly coupled. Because if they are tightly coupled, you're going to end up with one failing, another one failing, and it's going to... Instead of trying to solve one problem, you're going to have to resolve multiple microservices. And this is a very important reason why the microservices should be isolated. If they're not isolated, that's going to end up happening. So one of the great benefits and one of the reasons why microservices are so resilient is that you can separate your application um, and make sure that if one service fails, you can degrade gracefully. So if you think of an instance like maybe Facebook, if the Facebook Messenger was to go down, it doesn't crash the entire site. They might just say, sorry, the Facebook Messenger isn't available right now. So in that case, they've handled degrading that service correctly. Another benefit is scaling. When you think of scaling a monolith, you have to scale the entire system. You might put it on different machines, different servers, whatever the case is, but you still have to scale the entire service, the entire monolith together. Microservices are easier to scale as we can scale smaller independent services instead of one big monolith. So in our case for Superblist, we moved to microservices as while the load during normal times is perfectly fine, you basically end up with an anomaly where you have uh, huge sale days or payday or Black Friday 
suddenly your traffic spikes to like 12 times what you expected it to. And if you haven't prepared for that properly, you're going to end up with things failing. And we found with the monolith, it was quite hard to do so. Another benefit of microservices is the ease of deployment. Deploying monoliths is dangerous because even if you have to do a one-line change in a million-line monolith, like you might be changing the smallest thing and you think it's insignificant, but you end up having to deploy the entire monolith. And if it could be something stupid, you missed a semicolon, you, it's a very high-risk deployment because if it fails, you're now going to be sitting with your entire site falling over. Microservices, deploying them is a lot safer because we deploy them independently because we can deploy isolated services. And then this means, okay, maybe we deploy a wishlist service and it falls over. We can then isolate what the service, the problem was and roll back the service and restore the system functionality. Um, so if we, in terms of microservice adoption, if we look at a company like Netflix, this is a slide from AWS reInvent 2017. Um, this graph here is all of their microservices. They have, a, they, in this slide, they had 700 microservices. Um, now I'm sure in 2019 they have a lot more. So it's definitely a pattern that's been adopted and that is in use by big companies today. One of the benefits of microservices is composability. And composability is sort of designed, it's defined as a system design principle whereby the interrelationships of your components is very important. A very composable system will provide components that can be selected and assembled in various combinations to satisfy different user requirements. Um, basically, it means with microservices, it allows us to reuse them in a specific way. Um, and so they lend themselves well to being very composable. And the reason why this is important is if you think of web dev today, we no longer develop for one application. Um, while as in, when, in the age of like when you had a lot of monoliths, you would develop one monolith and it would be for a website, for instance. Nowadays, you also have to support your website, your mobile API, your PWA site, whatever the case is. So it's a lot more involved and there's a lot more. You have to make sure that your microservices can sort of uh, cater to more different, more different events. So unfortunately with microservices, um, although they're great and we've gone through the benefits, they really aren't a, a silver bullet. You can't do them in every project. There's some projects where it's just not a great idea. And the reason for that is that they come with all of the complexity of distributed computing. Um, because no longer are you working on a single monolith application, you're now working with multiple uh, systems talking to one another. Um, so in terms of your, your organization, like let's say you want to implement microservices, it really depends. It depends how big your organization is, what your specific user or domain requirements are, um, and also how ad aggressive you can be in adopting microservices. So let's look a little bit at the cons of microservices. So as we talked about, they add complexity. So one of the places that they add complexity is your deployments. With a monolith, you might deploy uh, a single application. Maybe it's on multiple servers, but maybe let's say you're sending a tarball or whatever it is to multiple servers. It's quite a straightforward process. Um, with microservices, instead of deploying now to one application, you have to deploy multiple um, applications at the same time. Another complexity is managing your logging and monitoring, and we'll touch on this later. But if you have a monolith, you have to log in one place. It's generally obvious what is happening. You know, a function failed. You can see in the logs this is what fell over. But if you now have systems communicating with one another, it becomes a lot less clear what went wrong. And a very important part is we spoke about the benefit of how microservices are more resilient and they allow you to prevent cascading failure. But you have to actually make sure that your systems are engineered for that. Because just because you, you know, that's like a benefit, if you don't handle that properly, you're going to lose that together and then you lose the point of why we're doing it. So we've looked a little bit at what microservices are, what their advantages and cons are, but let's actually look at how we would model them. So I find it's helpful to set the scene. Um, in our case, what we're going to do is we're going to create a very simple auto management system with a products microservice, and we're just going to create our first microservice in this way. And then we're going to be using Laravel, Docker, and Logly, which is for distributed logging. So first off, what really makes a good microservice? And there's a number of characteristics to this. They have a lot of advantages, but the ones that we're really focused on is loose coupling. So obviously, it's the opposite of tight coupling. Loose coupling means that your, your microservices are independent and they don't rely on one another. 
And then another one is high cohesion. So when you think of um, when you think of how you group code in a monolith, you want to make sure that your code is cohesive. If you have, uh, let's say, a user user authentication logic or user logic, and then you also have product logic, you want to make sure that the, those specific functions are sitting in the correct place, if that makes sense. Um, so you want to make sure that your microservice is loosely coupled and it's very cohesive in what it's doing. It's fulfilling one requirement. You don't end up with an order service that is also managing your, your products or whatever the case is. So we're going to take a brief foray into how we're going to model a microservice. And this comes from, this is a concept from domain-driven design. Um, and it's the concept of bounded contexts. So what do they actually mean? Well, if we look at the formal definition, it means that any div given domain consists of multiple bounded contexts. Um, so that's, that's great. That really helps a lot. Um, <laughs> And then a bounded context in terms of what it's actually defined by is it's a specific responsibility enforced by very explicit um, boundaries. So when I read this, it didn't really make sense to me. I didn't have that light bulb moment of like, this is what it means. So I just thought of an, a bit of an example. So if we think about an organization, let's say it's a company, and we have uh, John that works in the IT support department and Jack that works in the sales department. Um, those two departments are very clearly defined and they're very clearly separate. We can see here, so we can see that they're doing very different things. And the key point here is that John would never do Jack's work and Jack would never do John's work. It's very explicit boundaries with very explicit domains. Um, and well, at least I hope so, because if you have an IT support guy doing your sales, you're not going to get a lot of sales. <laughs> The next is, um, we're just going to go forward, and the reason behind, behind uh, bounded context is they allow us to model our domains in a way that we don't share internal representations of our models. Um, and this is very important, so we're going to look at that when we get to databases, but um, that's quite an important key. And bounded context, as we looked at in our example, they lend themselves very well to identify the boundaries b b uh, between your code. So if you look here, if you, look, you define your context, the boundary is very clear. And obviously, this is a, a sort of a more dumbed down example, but you could have an order service and a product service in this case. Um, and then these bounded contexts become very excellent candidates for microservices. So now we're going to look at splitting the monolith, um, and we're just going to look at some of the tips and tricks and the methodology involved in that. So, first off, like where do you really start? If you think of a monolith, it, does, you know, it doesn't just appear. You start with a small package or a small idea or business requirement, and then you add code and you add code. And um, it actually it eventually just grows into this big thing, which is sitting in your, in your repos. People are scared to touch it because it's a little bit too much. Um, and also, by the de very definition of a monolith, they are not loosely coupled. They're often uh, very tightly coupled. Um, because if you do even a single, single line deployment, it's still very scary. Um, and they often, we try to make them cohesive, but they're not really cohesive because you often end up with, oh, I'm just going to add this feature, and I don't really like, you know, you add it, and then it, it impacts another feature. So there's a lot more to consider um, in terms of using a monolith. So the next thing with bounded context is to look at seams. And a seam is a portion of code that can be treated in isolation and worked on without impacting the rest of the code base. Um, so to break up a monolith, it is very important that you find seams in your application layer. We're going to look at how that works. Bounded context makes, once you define them, make it very obvious to um, define to see seams because by definition, bounded contexts are cohesive and loosely coupled. So the first step is to really split into packages. Um, so if we look at our, our example of an order management system, we could have something like an orders package, and then this is for managing all of our orders. We could have a products package for managing all our products and our stock. And then a users package for managing our users and their information. So it's quite simple. So let's say we've now modeled this and we've grouped it into our different contexts. So what we've taken is we've taken our big monolith, we've grouped the code into different packages. And what we've ended up with is, OK, cool, we have a users package, a products package, our orders packages and then our front-end package, which is responsible for the front-end code. And if you look here, what it becomes very obvious when you've modeled this is you see these, these lines, the dotted lines, they are the seams. So it becomes very obvious what package should be responsible for what, 
and if, like, if, how the communication will occur. And eventually these seams will translate into API calls. So eventually what we want to end up with is instead of a package, we want to split it out into a service, product service, front-end service, uh, and then order services as an example. So we're going to look at um, how to do this. There's many different ways of doing this. Um, generally, when you group your code into packages, almost every tool has this. So in PHP, we use something called namespaces. Um, and that just allows you to group, uh, relate cohesive code together. Um, in Java, it is literally called a package, so that's brilliant. Um, but it's very important to actually slow down. So we're, we're, we're modeling it, we're, do, we're doing our domains, but um, when you, if you try to do this on an actual monolith, this is something that could, like, it could take, it could be very quick, it could take several weeks, but if you have like millions of lines of code, it's gonna take you months to split this thing out. And the important part of, behind it is not to look at splitting everything at once, but to split the code accurately. So you wanna make sure that you have an idea of how you'll split it, but you're not gonna split everything, which we're gonna look at now. So there's a concept called evolutionary architecture, and generally my advice is when you split up, split up a monolith, you think of it almost as like a slab of marble. You're gonna chip away at it incrementally instead of doing it all at once um, or sort of building it up. So I'm sure we can all, all agree, once you've implemented architecture, it's very hard to change it. It's not a simple thing to do. Um, and evolutionary architecture is really cool, and it's a terminology created by Rebecca, Rebecca Parsons, Patrick Kerr, and Neil Ford. And it just basically refers to architecture which has the ability to change over time. Microservices enables this in a very incremental way because what we can do is, let's say we've defined our architecture, and now we want to add something else. We can simply add a new microservice or take one away. So our, our architecture can evolve a lot better. Um, thanks everyone, we're going to continue where we left off. Um, so we're quickly going to look over what evolutionary architecture is again. Um, so evolutionary architecture is defined as a terminology, um, and it's defined as architecture which has the ability to change and evolve over time. Um, and obviously microservices enables this in a very incremental way. So if we want to look at an example, here we have um, sort of a diagram of what you generally end up with. So here's a monolith. It has uh, authentication code that is like grouped into a package. And in terms of how you are going to look to split apart uh, your, your monolith using evolutionary architecture, is you're going to end up wanting to write the new authentication service and then eventually direct traffic to your authentication service. And if everything works as intended, you don't have any issues, you're going to then retire the old code. So you can see it's no longer in the monolith. Um, it's very important that you delete the old code because what happens, and the anti-pattern of this, is that if you don't remove the old code, you now end up with two conflicting, uh, for instance, authentication packages, and it's really a terrible thing. It's gonna cause you a lot of pain. Um, cool, so let's look at the methodology to split out the microservice. So we've gone over, you have to establish the bounded context and the seams, and that gives you an idea of what you're working with and what you're modeling. You're then gonna identify the code to split out and you're gonna group it into packages. You're then gonna create the microservice to accomplish the same functionality. And then you're gonna direct your traffic to the microservices. And if everything goes okay, as we saw in our example, we're gonna retire the old code in the monolith and it's no longer gonna be present. So in that case, we've actually made the monolith smaller, which is what we're aiming for. So it's quite hard when you're new to microservices to choose your first microservice. Um, Often when people learn about this, they think, okay, well, I'm just gonna do a big, big, big bang rewrite, and I'm gonna like just abandon this monolith, I'm gonna rewrite everything in microservices, it's the best thing ever. Um, this is sort of a terrible idea, um, and there's a number of, of factors in that. But the number of factors that you need to look at when you're choosing your first microservice, and just some tips that I would say, is you need to look at the pace of change. So let's say you have, let's say you're gonna be adding new functionality to an orders package in your monolith, and you're gonna be doing this frequently and it changes a lot. That would be a good candidate for your first microservice, because if you split it out, it's a lot easier to deploy that uh, orders microservice than it would be to deploy your entire monolith again. Another key thing to think about is isolation. So how isolated is your code, um, and how many dependencies does it have? So if we thought of an authentication service, that was a great candidate because I mean, unless you're writing some terrible code, your authentication service should just be authenticating people. So it's very easy to split that out. Another factor is risk. So if you have a customer-facing um, 
pod, like pod package in your monolith. That is very important to the way, maybe it's like a checkout system. That would be something you'd want to migrate last because if something goes wrong, it's gonna be a lot harder to fix that. So one of the important things to look at when it comes to microservices and choosing your first one is tangled dependencies. So we've identified the seams and the boundaries between our bounded contexts or our microservices. But one of the, uh, the question then becomes, of these seams, how entangled are they? So let's say, uh, so Java has a really cool tool called Stan, there's the website. And basically it generates a graphical representation of your code base and how many calls are going in between, between your packages or your classes. So here we can see that we have this Java package and it's doing a lot of calls between these different packages. And we can see like 48 calls, 34. So this would be like a really terrible uh, idea for your first microservice. Because in order to split it out, it's gonna be a lot harder to actually make retain the same functionality. These calls that are happening between classes are gonna end up becoming calls between microservices and that's gonna become very slow. So one, the, probably the mother of all tangled dependencies when it comes to splitting out your monolith is the database. Um, I often find that when people are new to microservices, they will, they will just be like, okay, I'm gonna split out the application logic, that's great, and then they end up in a situation like this, where you have your user's service, your product service, your order service, if you think of our order stock management system, but they haven't actually split out the database. So now you have a big monolithic database that is serving all of these services, and this is not great for a number of reasons. So the problems with the monolithic database design is mainly that it's a single point of failure. If you're running on microservices now, and let's say you start small and you have like 10 microservices, if your, monolith fall, if your monolithic database fails, everything's gonna fall over. You're not gonna be able to do any, any more calls. Sure, you might have cached data, but that's gonna eventually become stale and it's gonna become a problem. It's also very bad for data retrieval and performance over time, because if you have multiple microservices that are now writing to this database, you may end up with situations where you get locks, um, and also you can eventually end up with these huge tables, and just doing something simple like selecting everything from the table is gonna start becoming quite slow. Um, and similar to the application, when we wanted to use microservices, and one of the benefits was that we could choose the right tool for the job, if you're uh, using a monolithic database design, also constrains you to one type of database. So you can, let's say you go with a MySQL database with a monolith database. Um, the, basically what then happens is you, if maybe that, that's not the right case, maybe for another microservice you want, might want to use Postgres or a NoSQL store. So it's actually better to choose with this, we can have the right tool for the job for our database too. So, in terms of how we want to implement the database in our, in our microservices, this is ideally what we want to end up with. So we want to have our user service, products, orders, and then we want, the important part is that every microservice has its own database. Every microservice should control its own domain knowledge. Um, and the reason is because we want them to be isolated. And we don't want that single point of failure where everything falls over. Um, so, just as we found seams in our application layer, how do you then split out your database? Well, it's the same thing. You need to find seams in your database. So it's equally as, as important. And basically, one of the really critical things of um, splitting out your, your monolith is to make sure that when you design your microservices and you model them, that the microservice has the exact data that it needs for its domain. Because the problem is, if you then have multiple microservices and let's say your order's product, your order service has to go and query something for one particular order item, every single time you're gonna to have to start querying that other, that other microservice. So you need to make sure that you model it, that you have the correct um, data. So there's a tool called SchemaSpy. Um, it's really, really helpful to model your database and to find, establish where your seams are. So uh, you'll just install Graphers, which is just a seed tool to do um, to model your graphical representations or your, your graphs. Um, and then we'll, we'll just use Java jar just to basically analyze our database and give us some output. And the cool thing about SchemaSpy is that it's a jar file, so you don't have to host your data anywhere or in the cloud. So if we were to do that, SchemaSpy would give us something like this. So this is an example, and we can see it's just basically generated all the different foreign key constraints that we have. Um, but it becomes very apparent then what your seams are. So where are your foreign keys and where are you gonna to have to break them out? So maybe you'll have your publishers in a microservice, but then you want 
or your book information in another microservice. So, that, so then your scene becomes this publish ID to publisher ID relation. So, okay, great, but how do we actually split the database? Um, I would recommend when you're, when you're splitting your databases in the way that we did it, is you break parts of your database into smaller databases. Um, the reason for this is that it's easy to revert because then let's say something goes wrong, uh, you can simply re remove the new tables and re return to your existing schema. Um, and generally when moving from a monolith to a microservice, I would recommend splitting the database first. And the reason for this is that then you make sure that your microservice has the domain knowledge it needs. So this is generally in a monolithic database what we end up with. So let's say we have a product table, we have an orders table, just as an example, and then we have an order products linking table. So this is great, this, I'm sure we've all seen this. This is generally how you'll model something like this. But now, if you think about it in a microservices way, we said that we want a product service and an order service. So what's gonna happen to this relation? Where's this gonna sit? Um, and that's a challenge then that you have to address when you move over. So what I would do and what I think the, what we want to end up with is we want to end up with an order service, a product service in terms of our microservices, and then each microservice owns the domain data that it needs. So it has our orders table, order products table, and then our products table. So basically we've removed the foreign key relation, we're now doing, but it's, we're maintaining it at an application layer using network calls. So one of the problems with that is we've now removed the foreign key relation, so what, how do we actually ensure data integrity? What we really don't want is we don't want a situation where we have new orders coming in and they are referencing products which no longer exist or are now out of stock. So how do you actually ensure that between your microservices that your data is, is actually correct? So there are many approaches to pro solving this. Um, there's distributed transactions, there's syncing, there's the event bus. And generally what I'd recommend and what we, we implemented was the event bus or event sourcing approach. And this is when each service will send events for, for its changes, so it's an event-based architecture. And the interested parties will then listen and save the info as needed. Um, this is often implemented with PubSub. And there's multiple PubSub providers. We use Google PubSub, but there's AWS SNS, there's Socket Cluster, which is open source. So there's, there's quite a lot of things out there that you can use for your event bus. Um, and then this is what it actually looks like. So this is what we want to end up with, with an event bus architecture. We want to have our product service, order service. They still have their separate databases. But now let's say, let's say a product goes out of stock. That's the scenario that we're looking at. We then want to publish an event from our product service. It'll then get consumed by the event bus. So let's say we're using Google Cloud PubSub. And an important step here, which some people leave out, which I think will help a lot, is to then store that event in some sort of storage database. Because if, you, let's say, your subscriber fails to get it, you still have redundancy because you've already stored the event and you can replay it. Um, so yeah, so your publisher will publish the event, the event bus will consume it, and then your order service will have some sort of uh, subscriber that will then consume the event and then it will update its relevant database. So that way your order service will know, okay, well, this is products out of stock, don't accept any more orders with that product. In terms of um, microservices, there are some DevOps tips that I think are cool. Um, so when you think of a monolith, all of your logging is central. It's in one, it's in one place um, and it's very easy to track what happens. With microservices, it's a lot harder because you end up doing network calls between your services. So I would definitely recommend an approach for distributed logging. There's a lot of examples. You can use things like Kibana, Logstash, or Logly. Um, and, but that's very great, but how do you actually then reconcile those? You're now gonna have a lot of events from a lot of microservices, but how do you know what was the flow? So if you wanna track something like this, like an order, an order, a user places an order for an item, then goes to our front end, goes to an order service, billing service, payment service. How do you know that that was the flow that happened for that user? So the way to do that is to attach a correlation ID, and then you attach it to the particular transaction in your microservice, and then basically all the other logs will have that transaction ID. So if you then wanna see, okay, something failed, you can then go back and look at your correlation ID. Um, another tip is to ensure your logs are searchable. If you're gonna end up having a lot more logs from a lot more microservices, it, you need to have some sort of tool that makes it very easy to search them and see what's going on. And another thing is monitoring. 
So if you think of it a monolith, one of the main things you end up monitoring is like host level metrics. You end up monitoring stuff like your CPU usage, network usage, your disk usage, your memory usage, that sort of stuff. And the problem with that is that now in a microservices based architecture, that's actually not enough. Because you could end up in a situation like this, where you have a client who makes a call to another client, who then makes another HTTP request, and then it fails. But you needed this whole process to complete. So the problem with this is that if you're just checking your host level metrics of your service, they could all be reporting, okay, we're fine, this is all great. But and one thing you have to monitor is now the networks between your services. You need to actually have alerts for if your one network, can't, your one service can't communicate to another. So now we're gonna look briefly at crafting our microservices application. Uh, we're going to look at the, pro the product's microservice, and we're mainly going to check that it can degrade gracefully, because that's a very important part of microservices. So we're going to build a very simple product's microservice. We're going to use PHP 7 and Laravel 5. Um, we're going to focus on the product microservice, and our toolbox is going to be uh, PHP 7, Composer, which is package, to package management for PHP, um, Laravel 5, and then we're going to use Docker for containers, and we're going to use Monolog to handle logging, and then our distributed logging is going to be Logly, which is a cloud provider for logs. So when you want to set up your first microservice, we're just going to do Composer Global Require Laravel Installer. It's just going to install the Laravel Installer, and then you can just use this command in your command line to start a new Laravel application, and that'll give you all the required frameworks and files that you need. We're then going to set up Docker, and we're going to use Docker Compose. So if, we, if you think about how we wanted to model this, we wanted an, a, an API and a database. So we need to make sure that we spin up containers for those two things. So you're just going to spin up a Docker container. We're going to have the container name, the env file, volumes. We're going to have a network. There is a front-end service to this, but we're focusing on the product microservice. Um, and then just some various environment variables. Another step then is to look at our MySQL. So it's very similar. We're just going to use MySQL database, and then we're going to set up some environment variables, set up the volume, and we're going to make sure that it's on the same external network, in this case, as our front, win, our front end service. To test that this is up and running, we're just going to use Docker Compose Build, and we're going to actually just spin up our containers after we built the images. And you should end up with something like this, where you end up your product, product MySQL, and then multiple front end um, services. So then how do we actually make our product? How do, how do we actually design it? So the first thing is we're just going to use Laravel's artisan command, and we're going to make our product model, and then we're going to use MCR, which makes our model, our controllers, and our uh, routes. We're then going to look at our migration, and we're going to have a very simple migration. So we're gonna just going to have an, an primary key, name, slug, price, quantity, images. So it's quite simple. And then we're going to look at our roots. And for our roots, we're going to have the products index, which will return all the products, the product store for saving, the product show for retrieving a single product, and then the products delete for removing a product. So if we then look at our controller, what we're going to end up with is our index uh, function. And this is just going to return all the products as JSON, which is very straightforward. We're also going to look at show. And what show is going to do is it's going to um, check whether or not a product exists, and it's going to check if the product's in stock, and if it does, then it will actually return the product to the, to the consumer. Delete is very obvious. It's just deleting stuff, so that's pretty simple. Um, and then we're going to look at setting up distributed logging, which is sort of the cool part of it. Um, so this is very simple in Laravel. You literally just set up a new provider with the API key, and you tag it with whatever your service is. And then you tell Monolog, which so in Laravel, whenever you do a log, it goes to Monolog, and then you can log it to files and different services, different um, devices like streams, HTTP streams. Um, and we're just going to tell Monolog to use the new Logly handler, handler and then push all of the events to Logly. Um, and then we're going to end up with a situation where we're just going to use the Laravel facade to log info just to see that we actually get it to the device. Cool. So now let's look at a demo. Uh, cool, so if we go here, we can see we have all of our containers running. And then here's our little very simple micro shop. We just have like our little products going on. Um, and now we wanted to make sure that this actually degrades gracefully. So if we now kill our, or we stop our product API, so now we stop that. So the idea is that hopefully 
our front end service doesn't fall over. So it still works, it just says that there's no products available. Um, and that's basically what we wanted. And then also we'll see in Logly that we're gonna have new events um, because we sent events to it. Internet, please. Uh, and here we can see we have new events from, from right now. So that's, that's essentially what we want. Cool. Um, so this was obviously a very simple example. And there's a reason why I chose to do a simple example like this. Often when people look at implementing microservices, they think about it the same way as they do implementing a monolith. They think this needs to be a huge thing, it's gonna take forever. And actually implementing your first microservice can be as simple as that. If you wanna do a very simple authentication service, I guarantee you, you can probably do it in like a night. It's not gonna take that long. So you don't have to approach it with the same mindset as you approach a monolith where you're scared because it's gonna be huge. Awesome. Um, so now I'm gonna look at some war stories. So. I was a bit of a harassment to my coworkers and I asked them for some feedback around what they thought when we moved from monoliths to microservices. Um, so basically, monitoring microservices is very difficult. The reason for this is that it creates overhead and management. And the, the issue is that if you have multiple teams working on multiple different services and they don't have correct standardize, standardization practices, then this can be a pain point because then you have logs that are on different places, um, and so it's very, very important to have standards, standardization for your microservices. And the greatest benefit from an application standpoint is obviously what we talked about, isolation, separation of concerns, and you end up with a single purpose system. Microservices ultimately take longer to develop and start. Um, and I, I, I agree with this. I think if you're starting a new project and you don't intimately know the domain of this project or the product you're building, I think starting with microservices is kind of a bad idea. And the reason behind that is if you have now, you've started with microservices, let's say you model one or two of them wrong, or you need to add something new to like a user service or whatever, you're gonna have to change now in two places instead of just changing in one with a monolith. So I think it's quite generally quite cool to start with a monolith and then split it out. Um, and then moving to microservices greatly boosted our developer productivity um, because we could then have different, different teams responsible of different projects and they could all work on their different microservices instead of having to work on one big monolith. Um, in terms of some resources, there's Building Microservices, which is a really cool book by Sam Newman, and then there's Microservices in Action, uh, also a really cool read. So if you want to read more and learn how you can do it more, those are good resources. And um, cool, thanks. Thank you for your time. So any questions? No, Ryan. <laughs> um, one thing that's been keeping me up at night when I think about microservices, uh, which we haven't had to deal with yet in our environment, is reporting. So mm. normally, like, if you've got MS SQL, you know, you just s slap on reporting services on top of it, and mm. all works well because it's all in one database. Now... If you're going to be getting, because you know, a client always wants to export the whole database to Excel so they can make their pivot chart. Yeah. Um, other than saying no, is there is there a way that you've found to to do that type of thing where you're doing cross microservice reporting on multiple entries? Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, to keep data consistency, we push everything into an event logger, so all of our events end up there. Um, that's actually sitting in like BigQuery. So then, if you want to do reporting on it, you can actually utilize BigQuery. And because it's like a Google product, it can handle an insane amount of scale, you're almost never gonna reach a point where you have too big of a table to query. Um, and then it's got cool things with that. You can like export to CSV, you can download the data sets. Um, so I think you need to push all of your reporting to some sort of centralized source in that case. Okay, so it's like a, a, data a mini data warehouse almost. Yes, yeah, I think okay, that would be- Okay, that's interesting, a... thanks. Cool. Other There's one right at the back. Me. Cool. How's it? Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, when you spoke about uh, splitting that foreign key and the the order uh, microservice. Uh, you said uh, you'd consume uh, that event bus. Uh, obviously, you'd need to keep, you know, that product 
uh, when it's expired uh, mm. stored somewhere so you can do validation. Uh, yeah, so, um, so basically what you're going to do is your product microservice will still maintain the state of its products. So it will know when this is now expired based on how many orders come in. Um, and the only real reason for using the PubSub is that then you can then publish an event, say like, hey, you can have multiple events, but for instance, we'll say like this product is out of stock. And then when that goes to, gets consumed by the order service, it will then update its own database. So that's sort of how you ensure that they're in sync. Don't know if that's... Okay, cool. I was just thinking now you are keeping product information in your order uh, database. Mm, it it kind of depends what the responsibilities are. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Good question, though. Cool. Uh, oh, sorry, just on that, like in production now, uh, like how many of how many uh, event buses do you have? Um, we've actually got so we use Google Cloud PubSub, so we have one event bus, but we have um, like loads of topics on that, and obviously our scale is quite large, but compared to like Google, it doesn't struggle with it. Uh, hi. So I wanted to know your advice on handling duplication between services. If we have different teams working on different services. Yeah, if you have duplication between services, um, then that generally means you haven't split them out correctly. Um, so you also have to watch for your events and make sure you're not duplicating events. Um, that then becomes more of a problem around like event-based architecture. Uh, I. So I just wanted to ask, so with this new architecture where you've got uh, a database per service, mm. there's, it seems that there's a lot of uh, more HTTP going on, a lot of network requests mm. over just having one database. Mm. So I just want to find out what, what your approach is to handling failed network requests. Yeah, so um, I could maybe go back to, so basically with the event logger, the purpose behind something like that um, is that if an event, if a network request fails, you should hopefully have monitoring around it using something. Um, but what you'll then do is you'll have to be alerted that this transaction failed, and then because you've stored all the events, you can still replay the events. So then you can recreate, you'll, you'll be able to recreate like the users placing an order in this exact time by rerunning through all the events you have. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Cool. Uh, there's one over there. Um, yeah, my question is, uh, I, I suppose, a little bit more complicated. Um, you showed us how to uh, grab a monolith, break it down into microservices uh, by finding the seams and determining mm. your domains. Uh, my question is, uh, what if you're in a situation where you have a monolith that is extremely tightly coupled? Mm. Um, like you have various dependencies that uh, obviously the one will break without the other one. Yeah. How would you how would you approach that? That yeah. So <laughs> it's never hopeless. If you use the right tools, you will be able to do it. Um, but in that sort of scenario, I would make sure that there's tests set up for the monolith. And then what you want to what you're going to want to do is whenever you're doing class calls between your monolith and you split it out into microservice, you're going to want to make sure that whatever data is coming back from your <laughs> from your microservices still allows your tests to pass. Because that'll be a very good metric around whether or not you're gonna um, still keep the same functionality. Because yeah, it's definitely a very difficult problem. If you have a huge monolith and you wanna split it out into microservices, um, you need to make sure that you still, you don't break anything in the process of doing so. So it's quite important to have tests. Yeah, cool. Cool, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.